to open through a conversation with you guys. It's going to last about 30 minutes. I think one of my favorite parts is every month we have a woman right here at First Church who shares her story alongside of me. And I'm just so excited for you guys to hear that story tonight. It's actually Katie Market, if you know her. Um, and also, something if you are new, we made a journal that everyone here gets when you come. And it is so amazing. Every month we have a different biblical topic that we believe is crucial for you to be able to live out your faith. And so this journal, um, it's a weekly journal that we get to do in the between the times we meet. So make sure if you have not gotten one to get one before you leave from your leader. And man, that being said, um, I just want to be honest with you guys. I know I am not the best speaker, I'm not the best teacher, and I know I'm not the most godly person. I know there are people sitting in here who are way more godly than me, but my prayer is that God is gonna speak through me or speak through the video or speak through your leader tonight and to move greatly among us. So with that, let me just pray really quick before I begin. Um, Jesus, I ask that you would just speak to these ladies tonight, that you would move in their hearts and my heart. God, I ask that we um, just learn together and grow together. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, so all that being said, the topic we are gonna talk about tonight is healthy friendships. And man, I think this is so crucial to our day and age because I think we are living in a time where there is a loneliness epidemic happening. And I'm not necessarily concerned with like the stereotypical recluses and the hermits. I mean, maybe we know somebody or maybe even in, well, I don't know if you'd be here if you felt that way. <laughs> but you know, I mean, I'm, lot, I'm sure a lot of people actually wanted to come, but they felt tremendous anxiety coming here. But that's not necessarily who I want to speak to tonight. I want to speak to the vast majority of us who maybe are lonely and don't even acknowledge it. And maybe we're not even aware of our loneliness. I think we live in a day and age where we are more connected than ever. I think some of you are sitting here and like, Kristen, I have more friends and people than I can possibly keep up with. And you're right. But I believe that we have our social networks keep growing and growing and the people we're connected to keep growing. But I think so does our loneliness. I think so does the thought man, our fear of if something really happened, who would be there for me? We have all these so-called friends. We have all these people who follow us and like our stuff online. But if something happened, if a heartbreak happened, if a trial came, who would actually be there for us? I think a lot of us here wonder that at times. And see, modern-day loneliness is not because we need more friends. I believe modern-day loneliness is because we are lacking intimacy. I think, right? I mean, I think most of us here, we can feel it. And I just need to, I just want to lay the foundation for this talk. True intimacy starts with Jesus Christ alone. We all know there's an ache, there's a loneliness, there's this need to feel seen by something or someone that no one in our life can possibly fill. And we all know that Jesus is the only thing who can fill that up. And so I think first and foremost, our intimacy, our lack of intimacy starts with our lack of pursuit of Jesus, our lack of relationship with him because he is the only thing who will ever fulfill that need. No friendship ever could. I just find the statistics based around our loneliness and our dissatisfaction in relationships astonishing. There is a woman, I watched her TED Talk, her name is Shanta Nielsen, and she surveyed 6,000 women. And she asked them, on a scale of one to 10, how satisfying do you find your relationships? One being, not satisfying at all, okay? 10 being extremely satisfied. So 6,000 people, and she surveyed them, scaled a one to 10. Okay, here are the stats. 50 to 70% of us said and rated a five or below. I want you to think about that for a moment. We are two to four times more likely to say we are satisfied at a one or a two than we are to put a nine or a 10. I think that's astonishing. I think we have a lot of relational dissatisfaction and dysfunction going on in the world around us. Guys, I really believe that we are hungry. We are starving for closeness and connection to people, aren't we? And contrary to popular advice, I don't believe the answer is to go make new friends, go out, join a club, do like join a sport league. Like I do not think that is the answer to this problem even though you can go online and that'd probably be most people's answers. I believe with my whole heart that the answer is we need to be seeking Jesus first. 
You know that deep down, even if you're here and you're not sure how you feel about the whole God thing, deep down you know that there's an ache that is needing to be filled with Jesus alone. Guys, I know that that is number one. But then from there, I think most of us need to go out and be a good friend. And if we're honest, I think a lot of us here, we don't know how to be a good friend, let alone a godly one. And I mean, I've been here. We're like, man, I really, I think we have the desire and we want to have good friends, but I think most of us here don't actually know how to be a good friend. And I think when we look to Jesus, who is the best model of healthy friendships, right? He is. I mean, he's God. He made us. He is love. He is the definition of healthy friendships. And I feel like when you look at his life, when you look at the way he lived, there are four common denominators that he lived out that define what a healthy relationship looks like. And before I jump into these four things, I just want to tell you, you're going to be strong in one of them. I think all of us here, we're naturally really good at one of these four. But I want us to have eyes and to be looking for where am I lacking? Where do I need God's help in one of these areas, okay? And also, when I'm talking about these four things, in order to have healthy relationships, you need all four. It's an equation. It's a puzzle, however you want to imagine it. But you can't just have two and expect to have healthy friendships. We need all four working together. So that being said, I'm going to jump right in. I believe when you look at Jesus' life, the first thing we need to have healthy relationships, healthy friendships, is joy. Can we all agree? I mean, it's the second thing. When you think of the fruit of the Spirit, it's love and then joy right after that. And how many of us, okay, I really want us to think, how many of us woke up this morning and were like, you know what, I think I just need a couple more negative, cranky, whining people in my life. How many of us were like that this morning? None of us, right? None of us felt that way. But here's the thing, and I am guilty, okay? I just want to lay that out there. How many of us is that our default in relationships? How many of us call our mom, our sister, our best friend, and the first things out of our mouth is all the things that are going wrong, right? We default to negativity. And that is not the way God wants it. He wants us to be experiencing joy. And we want to experience joy. When you think about friendship, that's what we want. We want the joy. We want the laughter. We want the love, right? And see, I think that when we are living this way, it doesn't feel good. When I call my friend up and I am negative and I get off the phone, it doesn't feel good, does it? And I think there's two reasons. I think the first reason is because it's sin. I mean, yes, I want to I want to make it clear. There are times in our lives where there's heartache, there's death, there are trials where we that is perfectly fine, where we need to talk that out. But I think if the majority of our life is just constantly being negative and looking at the bad side of things, Jesus calls that sin. And I think we need to view it as such. And I think the second reason, okay, first of all, because of sin, but secondly, I think it doesn't feel good because what do we want in relationships? We want to feel seen. Isn't that what we're looking for? We want someone to see us exactly who we are and to love us anyways. And I think when we're projecting this negativity, they're only seeing that. And in Christ, that's not who we are. And that's not who any of you are, really. That negativity that you're projecting, that is not who you are. And so you walk away from that friendship and relationship and you're like, that didn't feel good and I don't feel seen. And so I just want us to think about, are we choosing joy in our relationships? Guys, because again, when we get together, when we have plans to meet a friend out or to call a friend, what do we want? We want the smiles. We want the laughter. We want the acts of kindness. We want to feel loved. And again, I want to make it so clear. This does not mean we can't cry on each other's shoulders. Like Jesus cried. That is absolutely okay. But I love that social science is backing up what Jesus teaches. Social science is telling us that for every one negative interaction, we need five positive interactions just to even the playing field. That blow your mind? Five? That's a lot of work. I mean, if you think about your kids, even we're talking about friendships, but think about your marriage or your kids. Every time you lose it with your kids, you need to do five positive. Like, that, I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't have time in the day for that. <laughs> So, like, I hope you remember this. Like, guys, choosing joy is something that is so important in all of our relationships. I want us to check out James 1, 2 through 3. It says, guys, consider it pure joy, my sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Guys, so are you living in joy? Are you choosing joy? Because Jesus says, 
It's not just something that we choose when things are good. Joy is something that we choose in all circumstances. Guys, I want friends who point me to Jesus. I want friends who in our sad, they're going to say God's going to do something good in this. Like, yes, we need to listen. Yes, we need to hear each other out. But I don't know about you, but when I leave a conversation, I want somebody who's going to tell me, girl, you got this. God in you's got this. Let's go. Like, let's choose to see the joy. Let's choose to see the good that we know our good God is going to do out of this situation. How would our world change? How would our church change, our community change, if we were women who chose joy? I mean, I think we'd have way more people following Jesus. I just believe it. So guys, we need to be women who are choosing joy regardless of our circumstances. That is the number one point. So I'm jumping into number two. So first of all, we need to choose joy. Second of all, I believe Jesus models so clearly that in order to have healthy relationships, we need to be women of pursuit, right? Because how many of us have met great people, people who are filled with joy, we really enjoy, but if you never pursued them, if you never saw them again, that's not friendship, right? And I think this is the one that made making friends in school so easy because pursuit was just natural. I don't know about you, but I had a couple classes where I knew no one, right? And you walk in, you're really nervous, you're getting kind of the hot sweats, and you're like, oh, no, I don't know anyone. And you kind of sit by somebody else who doesn't know anyone in the class. But over time, you and this person, you become friends. You maybe not, you wouldn't have picked each other. Maybe you wouldn't have clicked. But because of constant natural pursuit, because every day you sat in that class for an hour, you become friends, right? And this is why it's so natural to have friends at church, at your job, at your, when you're in school, because pursuit is just something that naturally happens, right? But this is why it's so important for us to take this element and put it to work outside those contexts. Because what's the truth? Our God models this so clearly. I can't think of I mean, even when we weren't following Jesus, he was always there. He's been pursuing you from the day you were born. From the day he formed you in your mother's womb, Jesus has been pursuing you. And how good does that feel to know that? I mean, it feels so good. And like how awesome is it that we can make that feeling, that, that feeling that feels so good to know that we've been pursued by our heavenly father. We get, because it starts with him, we get to then go and share that with other people. That is our job. As Christians, we are to pursue people recklessly because our God pursued us recklessly. I want you to check out Psalms 139, 1 through 4. It says, Oh Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it? <laughs> Lord, I think that's so cool. I, you know what? He knows what I'm going to say five minutes from now and I don't even know. Like, I just think our God is so cool. He loves us. He pursues us that much that he is that in step with us. Guys, he is the best of friend to us in this way. So how are you living this out? How is your life? How is your pursuit of other people? Are you pursuing them regardless of how they treat you? Because we have this from our Father, I mean, we have treated God horribly, right? All of us in the room can acknowledge that. We have treated God horribly one time or another, and still, I mean, we're sinful. And he pursues us and loves us recklessly. Guys, how are we doing treating other people the way that we are being treated by God? Are we looking to serve and love and pursue people regardless of whether they deserve it? Or are we keeping people at arm's length and expecting the game to come to us? Because as Christians, that is not the way that we should be living. People on earth are desperately wanting to see God, and God is desperately wanting to use you, but it's time to start being women who will recklessly pursue others around you. Guys, again, the reason we're able to do this is because God first loved us in this way, right? We know that relationship with Jesus paves the way with our relationship with others. And so, ladies, I know we can do it. And God is so good to us when we do. There is blessing and there is treasure when we choose to pursue. So the first one was joy. The second one is pursuit. The third thing you need in order to be a healthy friend, and remember they all tie together, is to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is so important. This is where we reveal to people things about our life, and we do it in a safe context. There's nothing, I mean, it feels so good to share something that maybe you hadn't shared with anyone and be seen and feel safe. And I'm not just talking about when I'm talking about vulnerability. I don't believe Jesus is just saying, 
the shame, the guilt, the fears, the skeletons in our closet. Yes, all of those things. But I also think God is talking about the things that we're excited about, the blessings, risk bragging to each other, risk bragging about what God's doing in our lives, the things he's sharing with us. I think that is also tremendous vulnerability. I think that actually scares me more than talking about the bad parts of me. I, I don't know about you, but like I think telling somebody something good, like I have, that creates more anxiety in me, wondering if they're going to like reject me or like look at you and be like, who do you think you are, right? <laughs> that, but in order to have healthy friendships, that is something that is required, isn't it? And guys, I also feel like, and I especially feel like in this town, maybe, I don't know, you have to see if you agree with me, but I feel like part of vulnerability is not only sharing your feelings, but being willing to ask for help. I feel like you guys, like I ask for help, you are there in a second. Like you are so good at being willing to help. But I feel like, and me too, we are so bad at asking for help when we need it. And why? If I asked any of you for something, you'd be excited to do it, wouldn't you? You'd be like, oh, thank you. And I don't understand why we are depriving the people in our life of actually reciprocating that. Like, I think God says it is better to give than receive. And when we don't ask for help, we are depriving people of the ability to give something of themselves to us, something that they desperately want to share with us. So guys, when you think of vulnerability, I want you to be thinking about all of these things because at the end of the day, I know every single woman in here, you want to feel loved, right? And the only way we can feel love is to feel known. And we feel known when we share ourselves first off with Jesus and then with others. It's like everything I'm talking about, it starts out with your relationship with Jesus. And I think why we're not able to be vulnerable is because many of us in the room are not being vulnerable with God. And I, maybe you're like, I don't even know what that looks like. Because I think so often we're like, God knows everything. Why do I need to share anything with God, right? But if I was crying, okay, say you saw Eldon like kick me in the shin, right? <laughs> say it was just a really bad day and I'm in the lobby and I'm like, <laughs> right? And you're like, oh my goodness. You're like, Kristen, are you okay? And I'm like, and I knew you saw it and I was like, yeah, I'm fine. Leave me alone, right? Like you saw it, leave me alone. Would that make us have a better relationship or would that put a distance between us? Distance, that would hurt you, right? But here's the truth. I think many of us do that with God. I think we're like, here's something happens, and we're like, I'm ignoring God. He, are, he knew it. He knew it was going to happen. And I, like, I'm not talking to him about it because he already knows. When like that is not going to make our relationship better with him. What he wants is us to talk to him, be vulnerable with him, share our feelings, share our bad days. Because that, just like on earth, that is what's going to make this relationship better. It starts by being vulnerable with God. Because you know what? He is never going to reject us. He loves us, he sees us, and he is always going to return us with loving kindness. Yes, sometimes he loves us too much to stay as we are, <laughs> but he is the best, right? And if we can't trust God, how in the world are we supposed to go and be vulnerable and have healthy relationships here on earth? Guys, I love what 1 John 1, 9 says. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Guys, vulnerability with God paves the way for us to experience true friendships, true relationships here on earth. Don't forget that. Pour out your heart to God. Do it. I dare you. It feels so good. Your relationship with him matters, and it mat uh, your relationships on earth are a reflection of your relationship with Jesus. So guys, how are you doing in that department? First off, with God and with others. I really want you to take an inventory. Again, some of you are like, Psh. I'm really good at this, <laughs> right? But others of you, maybe you closed that door off a long time ago, trusting people and trusting God. And I want you to think about taking a chance, stepping out and being vulnerable again. Okay, so we hit three. So we got, we need to be vulnerable, we need to be women of joy, and we need to be women of pursuit. But this fourth one, again, they all work in tandem. This fourth one, I believe, is the most important. If you don't have this, you have never experienced healthy friendships. And this last one, I wonder if any of you know, but it is forgiveness. We cannot have healthy friendships if we are not women who are willing to forgive. And I believe that unforgiveness is the number one destroyer of relationships in our day and age. Guys, and I, like, I live this way. If you wrong, like, before Christ, if you wronged me, you were cut out. I didn't get any second chances. I was the worst at this. I just left a trail of destruction my whole life of hurting people and cutting people out because I was like, I, I mean, hurt people hurt people. 
I was, I was too broken to let anyone in. And I, I don't know about you, but I hate what unforgiveness does between me and people, and I hate what unforgiveness does between me and God. It destroys. I believe, I believe Satan loves when we hold on to unforgiveness because it destroys everything around us, including yourself. Guys, I have seen relationships end over a text message. I've seen relationships end over someone getting angry one time and someone not being able to let it go. I mean, I'm sure all of your minds are racing over maybe your own life or other people that you love that you're like, well, I just wish they could let that go. I just wish that they could forgive them. And I, when I say forgive, I'm not saying letting people back into your life who have abused you or hurt you. That is not what I'm saying. You have to, you, God calls us to healthy boundaries. But what I am saying is within those healthy boundaries, we are called to forgive. It is not a suggestion. Our creator says it is a mandate. It is obedience. We are called to be women of forgiveness. And mom's in the room. How many of us are telling our kids they need to do this? <laughs> right? I feel like a broken record. But how many of us are actually modeling it for our kids? Actually. How many of us have estranged relatives, estranged friends, that you, our kids are watching us hold on to that unforgiveness, drink that poison, and expecting it's going to hurt other people? Guys, forgiveness is a choice. It's not magic. It's not a feeling. I bet none of us in here, when someone hurts us or wrongs us, we're not going to be like, man, I really feel like forgiving them. You're never going to. That is why Jesus makes it very clear throughout the Bible that it is something we have to choose to do. Guys, every day people are going to offend you. Every day people are going to hurt you. And there's an enemy out there who wants to kill, steal, and destroy. And it is our job to step up and be aware and choose forgiveness no matter what. Because guess what? <laughs> what did Jesus do for us? What's the gospel? I mean, he, pay, he died to pay for our sins. And I know a lot of us, it's like, blah, blah, blah. I've heard this since I was two to now. But I really want us to think about this, okay? How many sins has Jesus forgiven? Thousands? Hundreds of thousands? Millions? I mean, how many sins? I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'm in the millions. Like, I'm not just <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm pretty positive he's forgiven me of all my sins, which are probably millions, right? So how in the world, when Jesus said it is paid for, it is finished, where we are dripping in grace, we are dripping in forgiveness, how in the world do we point at someone and say, not you. I am not going to extend that same grace to you. I feel like it is contrary to everything we believe. Ladies, forgiveness is not something that we can extend to those we feel like it. It is something we extend to every single person. I want you to think of your least favorite person, and they deserve it too, because guess what? God, I mean, I should be God's least favorite person. <laughs> I don't know if any of you else feel that way, but I have wronged him so bad. And you know what? He has forgiven every single thing. And when we are in line with him, that this starts with him. It starts with confessing our sins to him. It starts with confessing and asking for forgiveness from him because that makes us aware that we're sinful. And then we can overflow out of that gratitude from our creator. We're able to extend this to other people. Guys, true friendship cannot exist without forgiveness. This is where bitterness, comparison, um, what else? Resentment leaks in and it will ruin the best of friends. Luke 6, 37, B through 38 says, Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. It will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Mm. If that isn't convicting, I don't know what is. The measure you use will be the measure that will be used on you. That is intense. Guys, in order to have healthy relationships, we need to be women of forgiveness. I'm just going to keep hammering this home. We need to be women of forgiveness. Because, guys, let's be real. We do, not, we do not deserve God's forgiveness at all. Okay? Not at all. But you know what? He gave it to us anyways. And we get to give that same gift to the relationships around us. Okay. So, those four things, they need to be working together. We need to be women of joy. We need to be pursuing. We need to be vulnerable. We need to be women who choose to forgive. It is all so exciting. And again, really quickly, these things, first and foremost, we need to be doing these things with Jesus. We need to be asking and finding joy in his presence, right? In order for us to have joy in our relationships. We need to be vulnerable with Jesus before we're able to be vulnerable with people. We need to be pursuing Jesus every day. 
in order to pursue others the way he created us to. We need to be asking for God's forgiveness in order to be able to extend that same forgiveness with other people. Guys, this is what's going to change the world. But that being said, some of you here are like, okay, that's cool. I want to do that. But you're like, I, I still don't quite understand how I can have so many friends and still feel so lonely. And guys, again, Jesus, are you doing these things with him? That is first and foremost. But secondly, just on a tangible level, every, just every friendship, I don't care how much you click, I don't care how, you, you, we all meet people who are like, we're going to be good friends, right? Like, you just, you got that, you're like, yep, it's inevitable. But even those friendships, they all start out at the bottom. And when you increase your forgiveness and your vulnerability and your pursuit, they, that's when you get your best friends, right? And when you see great friendships, I mean, we all do, in real life, through the Bible, on social media, it's not because they found their best friend soulmate. That's not what it is. It's not because they find, like, that word, oh, I didn't find my best friend, I, or I had a best friend and they moved to Australia, right? Like, that's not what it is. Uh, you have to know that when you see really good friends, it is because they are working hard, and I believe they're pursuing Jesus and then pursuing each other in these four ways. If you see a good friendship, I would guarantee that they're doing these four things very well. Guys, and I just want to hit it again. I know I started in the beginning talking about how we are, there's a loneliness epidemic, and I believe it. I believe that we are craving these four things. We're craving intimacy. And I believe that our bodies are literally dying without it. Not only our physical, I believe our physical bodies, our mental health, but also our spiritual bodies are dying. Dr. Ornish, a New York Times bestselling author and world-renowned physician, states it this way. I'm not aware of any other factor in medicine. He says that intimacy and love. Okay, let's just talk for a moment. Who is the creator of intimacy and who is love? Jesus. Okay, so let's rewind. I am not aware of any other factor in medicine than Jesus. <laughs> not diet, not smoking, not exercise, not stress, not genetics, not drugs, not surgery that has a greater impact on our quality of life, incidence of illness, and premature death from all causes. Okay? In fact, if we are feeling lonely, it is as damaging to our bodies as smoking 15 cigarettes a day, being an alcoholic, more harmful than not exercising, and twice as harmful as obesity. Not putting Jesus first and therefore having intimate relationships, that is the biggest indicator of your health 10, 15, 25 years from now than any other factor. Does that blow your mind? I find that astonishing. I mean, some of us are like, I'm going to go get more food when I go out there. <laughs> right? <laughs> but then aside, like, man, this is how important pursuing Jesus is. Guys, this is why John talked on Christmas Eve about how coming to church, it affects your mental health. It affects, man, you have such great health benefits. Because you know why? Because Christians, because people in this church, we are more naturally and genuinely able to be these four things. Because guess what? God is living inside of us. So it just can't help but naturally flow out of us even when we're not aware. I find this so fascinating because seriously, people are calling this the number one public health issue of our time is loneliness. And we have the answer. Most of us here are sitting here with the solution. There are millions of people out there who are dying spiritually and physically, literally, and we have the solution. So what are we going to do about it? How are we going to extend this to the world around us? Guys, I believe every single major problem in our world at its roots is a lack of relationship with Jesus Christ. I believe the opposite of alcoholism, it is not sobriety. It is a relationship with our creator. We could go down the list. Homelessness, acts of terrorism, broken families, it all boils down to a lack of relationship with Jesus Christ and therefore not having genuine relationships with other people. Again, you cannot genuinely be these four things without a relationship with Jesus. We need these four things. We need to be modeling these four things in our relationship with him first, again, before we could ever go out into the world and share it with them. So guys, how is your joy in Jesus? How is your pursuit of him? Are you being vulnerable? And are you continually asking for his forgiveness and recognizing your need for his grace? 
Ah, again, our relationship with Jesus, it is the thing that paves the way to our relationship with others. Right now, we, I want us to play a video of a woman right here at First Church where she talks about her story and she so clearly models her life before godly relationships and after. I want you guys to check it out. I thought that my life was so good before. Everything just seemed to kind of fall into place. I had what I thought was a healthy home life. I had lots of friends. I won homecoming court representatives. I was Miss Indiana. I was the top of my class. But yet, yeah, I still felt so alone, so afraid. Like no one truly cared if anything happened to me. Would I really ever be missed? And I remember all the friends that I did have who I thought were good friendships. They would rub dandelions on my arms just to watch me swell up with hives. They would encourage an eating disorder. They would encourage me to stay in toxic relationships because it was as good as it gets. No one was there when I needed them the most, but that's all that I thought there was. I longed for this fantasy of friends who would be there. And I remember just thinking, going into college, that, okay, Purdue University has 40,000 students. Surely I can find a best friend here. But the first two years of college, I went through some really crazy stuff, and my life just started falling apart. No one was there to calm me down after the numerous panic attacks while my boyfriend was deployed. No one was there to hold me when my dad told me he was leaving. No one was there to comfort me while ending a toxic relationship, one full of many different kinds of abuse and neglect. But instead they told me, oh, it's fine. It's as good as it gets. And I just thought that's who friends were. So my whole life, I thought I had healthy friendships. I thought that that's what it was. But instead, I realized when I joined a life group here at First Church, and I met all these amazing couples, and the girls, they would, they would reach out to me while I was still away at school during the week. And they would text me, and I would look at it and be like, okay, like, what do they need? What do they want from me? But instead, they would ask me how they could be praying for me, how they could love me, how they could be there for me, and what I needed. And it wasn't until then when I realized that this fantasy I've had my whole life of having these best friends, having these friends that were truly there, who truly, genuinely loved me, that they were just in arm's reach, and that they put Jesus at the center of everything, and that I wanted it, and that I could actually have it. Those life group girls, they constantly pursued me. They constantly were feeding into me. And seeing that and experiencing that, I know that I want to pursue other people. I want to be that person that I longed for. I want to be that person that I didn't know actually existed. So I know that there is a woman sitting in this room right now who is filled with anxiety, who is filled with depression, fear, loneliness. I know that you've been through a lot of hurt. You've been hurt by a lot of so-called friends and that you honestly don't think that you have the potential to have healthy friendships. I know this because I was you. I know this because I went through the exact same things. And for 20 years of my life, I was filled with toxic, harmful friendships. And that my healthy friendships have just begun. But no matter if you're 13 or you're 85, it is never too late to find those healthy friendships. You are not alone in this world. But instead, just go out searching. Ask God for the boldness. Ask God to use you. Ask God to put these amazing women into your life that you have longed for, that you have desired. Because I promise you, it will be so awesome to just have that team around you, supporting you in your lows and in your highs. So I've learned that in order to have these healthy friendships, 
you really just need Jesus first. Because at the end of the day, whether you have healthy or harmful friendships, it is just you and God. And people will always disappoint you, um, unintentionally or intentionally. Um, but whether you're feeling alone, or you're filled with anxiety, or you're filled with depression, the one and only person who can take that from you is not the gal sitting next to you at church. It's not the gal sitting next to you at a party. But instead, it's God. He is the one and only person that can fulfill every single need that you have. Can we just give a round of applause for Katie? How awesome is that? I love how that video just so clearly shows her life like, okay, she wasn't following Jesus, she didn't have godly friendships. And I love that her God story is here are all these Christian women who are naturally doing these four things. And she's like, what is up with this? Like, this is so <laughs> countercultural. And because she experienced God's love and the people around her who she knew loved and followed Jesus, that is what led her to Christ. I just love that. And now, you, you know, if you know Katie, she now, because she has Christ, she is extending these things to everyone around her. It is just the natural side effect. Guys, everything I know, everything Katie knows about how to be a healthy friend, we have learned from Jesus. And yes, imperfectly. We're never going to do this perfectly. But he is the definition of healthy friendships. Guys, if you could walk away with anything tonight, anything, I want you to listen up right now. I want you to leave knowing Jesus changes everything. Not just our friendships not just our marriages. He will change every single aspect of your life. And there are things in my life where he still needs to change. <laughs> I'm still waiting for him to change. But I, he's going to get there. Like as Christians, that's the hope we have. He is changing everything gradually over time. It's not instant. But I know as I keep holding on to him, as I keep walking with him and following him, he is changing us. And that's what he does. He changes every single part of our life. And just like Katie said in that video, I know there is someone here who you are feeling so lonely. You feel so disconnected. And yes, as Christians, we can feel that way. But as Christians, that loneliness is a built-in mechanism where we're like, okay, I need more Jesus. Like, he's the only thing. We know he's the only thing that's going to fill it. So yes, we experience loneliness. But I know there was someone in this room where your loneliness is deeper than that. Your loneliness because you have never chosen to follow Jesus. You've never been like, okay, God, I'm done living my life. All the things that I've tried to fill this with, I mean, I tried to fill it with everything, you name it. If it was alcohol, people, relationships, guys, you name, uh, acclamations, anything, anything. You think of anything. I would try to shove it in my life <laughs> and be like, surely one of these things is going to fulfill me. But it never did. And I would, oh, it wouldn't matter how many parties I went to or how many people called me their best friend. I never was satisfied until I surrendered my life to Christ. And if you are here, and nothing has changed. Maybe you've been reading your Bible and you've been going to church and nothing has changed. These four things that we've talked about are foreign to you. I want you to take a moment and really think about whether you have actually surrendered your life to him. If, you, if the gospel is real and God is real and he says when we empty our lives, he, that is when he can, we can take this gift of eternal life and it is ours. Have you done that? Because I'm here to tell you it is the best thing that has ever happened to me. It's not the easiest thing. I did, you have to count the cost, but it's the best thing that has ever happened to me, and it is available to you. If you're here, it's as simply as going home and praying, Jesus, you can have it. My life is yours. I don't want it anymore. Come live inside of me. But if you're here and you're like, you know what? <laughs> I want that. To, I want tonight to be the night. I want you to know, talk to your leader. Talk to a friend that you came with you who you know loves and follows Jesus, who has that. Or talk to me, message, message me, message someone. Because this is why we do nights like this. Yes, to teach us who are following Jesus how to better follow him and better love people. But tonight is for you, whoever I'm talking about. Tonight was for you. God had tonight in mind for you. And he has been waiting a long time. He's been desperately pursuing you and choosing you over and over again, just waiting for you to come let him in. If that's you, do not let another day pass you by without going all in. Talk to somebody, please. But for the rest of us, for the rest of us in the room who we claim to follow Jesus, who we are following Jesus, we have his spirit in us. We need to be a part of this. 
We have to be a part of this. We have to start choosing to love and follow Jesus in these ways. Guys, we need to do this for our children, for our friends, for our coworkers, for our employees, for our teachers. We need to do this. We need, we can change the world because Jesus, because God, because the creator of the universe is living inside of us. He is living and breathing inside of us. We have what it takes to change the world. But before we can change the world, ladies, it starts with you. It starts with your everyday life. It starts with your children. It starts with your marriages. It starts with every day, little by little, finding these things in Christ and then doing it every day in your own life. And I promise you, when we live this out, when we walk out of here and walk this out, we will change the world. We will change eternities and we will change the kingdom of God because God can work with that when we walk in faith with him, when we are obedient to what he has already called us to. Guys, I hope today you leave knowing what four things you need to be doing what God is calling you to do, to be the change, to be the light in this world that is so dark and so lonely. Guys, not just for your sake, not just for First Church's sake, but for the world, ladies. My prayer is that we walk out of here and we start a blaze, we start a fire that can't be contained for Jesus. I just want to end and I'm going to pray that over us. Jesus, I just pray for every single woman in this room. I pray for the ladies who are following you. I pray that we would learn how to do these things boldly, that we walk in step with you, that the world would forever be changed because you are living inside of us and because you are God and you are love, and that is what this world so desperately needs. Jesus, for the lady in the room, for the ladies in the room who don't know you, who haven't chosen you, who haven't experienced your life and your power, God, I pray that tonight would be the night. I pray that they would feel you tugging on them so hard and that they would jump all in and that they would be able to be this change in the world that you so desperately have been waiting and been calling them to. Lord, we thank you, we love you, and we thank you that you use sinners like us, people who know we don't deserve it, to extend your love and grace to the world. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.